We have reached the appointed hour. We have a quorum. And so I will call the meeting to order uh, and read the standard opening statement. This is the Northampton hey, Conservation go. Northampton Conservation Commission meeting for the 24th of October, 2024. The commission is a group of unpaid volunteers who work to protect the natural environment of Northampton. We are concerned with the eight interests defined in the Massachusetts Wetlands Protection Act. Our duties also include open space uh, acquisition and management. We operate in a way that is consistent with open meeting law requirements. All meeting dates, times, and agendas are posted in advance, and we invite public comment during our meeting. However, we ask the public to limit their comments to issues that are within our purview. Today's agenda includes a notice of intent for a geothermal bore field and distribution piping installation. Uh, this at Smith College, adjacent to the Smith uh, Athletic Field, or in the Smith Athletic Fields and adjacent to the Mill River. Uh, and then a uh, notice of intent for remediation of contaminated soil and bank st stabilization. This at the old cutlery building, um, where things have been going on for many, many years, uh, as Mason will recall. Uh, then we have a request for a certificate of compliance on Water Street at an executive session to deal with, quote unquote, the purchase, exchange, lease, or value of real property um, for interests in conservation lands, uh, and then any other business not foreseen when the agenda was published. Um, so for starters, I'll ask if there is any general public comment not having to do with the case before us this evening. If not, uh, I don't think we have any minutes this week um, to approve. Uh, so we'll go straight uh, to the first NOI. The first hearing uh, is uh, at Smith College. Who's here to uh, represent that? Uh, this is Brad Aldinger from Haley and Aldrich. And we've got Charlie Conant from Smith College, and I'll introduce some other folks. Um, and I'll be the one sharing the screen uh, when you say it's okay. Give me just a second. Where's the button? <clears throat> right, you should be all set. Thank you. Okay, can everybody see my screen? It says geothermal Almost. project. Yes. Yes. Yep. Fantastic. Yep. Okay. Uh, thanks so much for your time this evening. Uh, we'd like to discuss the geothermal energy project proposed for the central district at Smith College. Uh, tonight, you'll hear from Charlie Conant on behalf of Smith College, Bill Talbert. On behalf of Salis O'Brien, the civil and MEP engineer for the project, and then you'll hear from Jim Pippin and myself. Hey, oh, thanks, buddy. I appreciate it. <laughs> and you'll hear from Jim Pippin and myself on, um, uh, and we are the uh, permitting geotechnical and HDD engineer. Um, so with that, I'll hand it off to Charlie. Yeah, so uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm just going to read you a quick introduction to um, why we're putting this bore field down on our athletic fields. Um, and I thought I'd start with a brief overview of the uh, geothermal project we currently have underway on campus. Uh, so Smith is committed to carbon neutrality by 2030, as you may know, um, through the Presidential Climate Commitment. And one of the first colleges in the nation to achieve net zero carbon emissions through the near elimination of campus fossil fuels uh, without using any other means such as carbon offsets and biofuel conversions. Uh, climate change is a critical issue for us. It's going, to extend well, it's going to extend well beyond the 2030 deadline for new neutrality. And like other student institutions, Smith College must be poised to continue its work in emissions of reduction, waste reduction, sustainable practices are working towards an equitable and just future for the world. Uh, already underway is a substantial geothermal energy product project. As you've known, over the last two to three years, we've been working in the North District, cent, uh, Quad District, and uh, we're now uh, entering into the Central District uh, geothermal uh, project. Um, we're gonna reduce our emissions by 80% over the next six years. And currently in the uh, North District, which is operating now, we've already taken 19% of our square footage off of the steam plant. So 
um, it's happening. Thanks for the next slide, Brad. Um, so we've got, uh, as I said, three districts, um, north, north of Elm, the Quadrangles up off of Paradise Road, and our central district, which is comprised of Central Campus and areas of Green Street and south of that. Um, the reason we have the three districts is there isn't actually enough physical space on campus to put a single well field. Uh, we would also have a fairly large uh, pump house energy station for that. We would have to fit somewhere. Um, the other reason for the three districts is the uh, the pipe sizes would get rather large, the pumping requirements would get rather onerous, uh, and we simply don't have room to place uh, all of those larger pipes on campus. We're working around currently not just water, sewer, um, and other infrastructure. We have steam mains, we have our own steam distribution now, we have our own fiber optic distribution all underground, we have our electrical distribution underground. So trying to fit in a another utility uh, four pipes that are rather large is, is challenging. So smaller districts made that more economically sensible. Uh, also the phasing to take the whole campus converted at once is, is uh, a real task. So we've divided into thirds, which is making it more manageable. Uh, and of course, the public requirements, the size of the pumps and the amount of volume of water would have to be pumped in a single district is, uh, is uh, a challenge. Um, currently we have the 72 bore uh, North of Elm uh, feel complete with uh, that re-landscaped. Uh, I don't know if you've been up to Davis Center to see the area, but uh, that has uh, been transformed from the Boer field back into a uh, campus landscape. Uh, we're currently, I think, completing the 62 boreholes in the quad district now. Um, they may be done. They may have just a few left to drill. And of course, we have the central district, which is going to be somewhere in the range of 260 uh, bores required down on the, on the athletic fields. Um, the reason we are over there uh, is we've looked at areas on central campus to put these wells. We don't have enough space. Uh, we have limitations uh, down along the dike because of the Army Corps requirements and so forth. We have uh, so we have a challenge, and, and the only area we could actually find uh, enough space was on the athletic fields. Of course that requires a pipe that's going to be uh, bored under the river, under the pond, and over onto campus, but that's uh, that's another part of our, our story here. Um, and so that, in, in a summary, that's where we're at. We're here working on the central district now, and we're heading towards the bore fields on the athletic fields. We're currently doing, we'll have some enabling projects to relocate temporarily some of the track and field events uh, to keep our athletics program going, but uh, um, that's underway, and we'll uh, restore all of that when we're done with the bore fields. So, any questions that, in terms of the geo project? Uh, uh, just would be helpful to understand what's involved in each bore. Uh, if so, you're going to have 72 of something called a bore, but uh, yeah. I have a feeling that that's a, a technical term in this case that is not necessarily what I might think of as drilling a, a well for my water or something like right. that. But, uh, there's probably a lot of techni technical jargon that goes into what they actually are, but they're essentially an 800 foot deep well. Uh, I'll let uh, others speak to exactly uh, the technical aspects of those wells. Thank you. Yeah. So, I, hi, everyone. This is Bill Talbert. I'm with Salas O'Brien. We're the uh, engineer, uh, design engineer for the overall project, and I'm the geothermal system um, design engineer, mechanical engineer by background. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the next slides we're going to kind of give an overview of the 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 geothermal system. So I could I could step into that and answer your question, uh, Kevin, on the the bore itself. Um, so just to kind of this these slides are kind of showing west side, east side of the river, and we can just yeah go ahead and jump to the next one. Um, so. Uh, the geothermal system is connecting the central plant or it, the overall geothermal system is tied to the new central plant um, piping um, distributes along the east side of the river and crosses under the river via the horizontal directional drilling and then is connected to the horizontal directional dr drilling pipe on the west side at the athletic fields and you can see the little more detailed layout of the the 250 260 bores that we have on the the west side um 
and so the bores themselves like we said are are those are 800 foot deep um holes basically that are being drilled they're approximately six inch in diameter and then those get uh a vertical uh a u-bend pipe that's a uh, made out of high density high density polyethylene plastic that is a uh, uh inserted into the the hole so there's a two pipes basically a down and back um and it's completely closed and that is inserted into the hole and the hole is grouted um, with a bentonite slurry mix so it's um, closed off seals off the um, you know the uh, aquifers and any um, there's no open um, portion of the board that remains so then those those two pipes that you know basically stick out of the top of the hole initially will get circuited together with that um, the line work that you're seeing there on the left um, will there'll be pipes that connect to every single one of those 250 plus bores. Um, so the, the fluid is piped from the central plant, um, you know, through the ground loop heat exchanger in a closed loop system. Um, so there's there's no um, interaction between the fluid in the pipes and the, the um, uh, ground or direct contact, I should say, with that. So, um, where the the boreholes themselves are drilled and and installed per the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection has guidelines for for these they do call them wells um, and there's similarities as far as what's required between you know water well drilling and installation versus as well as these these wells um, so there's regular you know requirements that were um, the drillers follow to uh, fall within those standards. That's mostly what I had for the geothermal system. So if there's any other questions. Uh, what is the temperature? Of, oh, sorry. Go no, go ahead. I was wondering what the temperature of the water is that's coming out of the uh, those pipes. Uh, the temperature of the fluid in the pipe is operating um, between approximately 40 degrees and 100 degrees. Um, and, you know, that varies over the course of the year. So in the heating season, we're cooling that water, if you will. We're extracting heat from the surrounding ground and um, putting that into the, the buildings. And then so colder water goes back to the ground or through the ground. And then vice versa in the summer, um, the, the water temperature is operating at a higher temperature. You have, you have calculations on uh, how much fluid you're going to lose in a period of time? Fluid from the piping? Yes. Um, there yes. isn't, I mean, it's a closed sealed right. system. The system is pressure tested at, you know, to a high, high pressure, operating pressure that or you know, test pressure that's beyond our operating pressure. So, so this system doesn't. Th there isn't any you know transfer of fluid to the ground. You won't lose any. So you only, you'll never have to add additional fluid. The additional fluid should come from. I mean, there are you know, there's various like in the system because this system ties to the say the the heat pumps that are in the plant, and there are various points where there might be relief on the system if there was a high pressure condition, um, and there is makeup water um, mm -hmm. that would get added to maintain the the system operating pressure that we're trying to you know operate at to protect pumps and other um, equipment on the system, but um, there isn't anything within you know from this from the central plant to the through the actual heat exchanger there is all buried pipe the one the one component is um, there's a vault where the the if you kind of see where all the the lines that connect the bores come out of the vault over on the west side and so that is a buried element of cylindrical hdpe device that um, contains some valves and is accessible from the surface but it's it's a closed, it, that's primarily there to set the system up and get it balanced and operating to the design condition. And once that's done, um, there's really very little um, interaction with that unless there was a, a problem, you know, if there's a, 
uh, damage to, to piping or something that gives you a place to isolate the system and shut close things down. Yeah, sorry, just to get back to my, I'm just curious, do you have a uh, an estimate of how much makeup water you'll need in a given period of time? Um, I do not at hand. I mean, in theory, there's, there isn't any, <laughs> um, I mean, you know, it's not losing, uh, unless there's a leak or, or mm -hmm. something that would, you would, would typically not be making up water to the system. If it, you know, if it exceeded pressure and had to do some pressure relief, or if there was a leak or something that would happen. So that would, those would be, you know, um, outside of normal operating kind of conditions. So my question is about the HDD drill fluid. What exactly is that? How is it used and how do you keep it from getting into the environment? So we've got um, Avi Huli here from Haley and Aldrich. He's the HDD design engineer. So I think he'll take that question. Okay. Yes. Good evening, everybody. Um, good question there. Um, it, the drilling fluid is pretty much inert bentonite material. Uh, more than 96, 97% of the water is just mixed with bentonite as such. That provides the necessary lubrication and the cooling required to drill through bedrock that we have for this project. Um, and again, it is um, technically a closed loop system where you have the uh, the bentonite that's released at the drill head that's all transported through the, the, the annular space back to your entry location and processed again. So uh, again, mostly it's water and inert um, uh, clay or bentonite. And there's a plan for its safe removal? Correct, yes. So we do have a, again, as a part of the closed loop system, there was there is going to be a mud recycling plant on site as a part of the temporary <laughs> equipment setup. Uh, the recycling plant is going to um, obviously, you know, suck up all that water. There's going to be vacuum pumps and whatnot that'll be used to, um, you know, put the water into the tanks and they would have a, a whole bunch of equipment to, in order to clean that fluid, if you would, and make it... Uh, um, to the point where it could be pumped back into the drill mud. And at some point, if it starts to sort of lose its properties, if you would, there's always an option to, um, you know, replace it with fresh drill mud and go from there. So. Mm, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. The system is designed to take care of the whole campus, but not the outlying uh, dormitories. Well, this will will get uh, nearly all of the campus. There's there's a number of buildings um, that will remain isolated, um, typically smaller buildings, um, maybe uh, residential scale almost that that are currently on gas or uh, boiler uh, oil part or their electric uh, heat pumps, air heat pumps rather than hydronics. So, not a hundred percent, but um, close to it. All of our major dormitories, uh, the quads. Um, the larger buildings on Elm Street, all of those large dormitories will be on the system. Thank you. Yes. Um, I understand that it's uh, technically a closed or theoretically a closed loop system, uh, but there were some concerns by NHESP with their conditions about uh, having detailed specific measures to uh, have a system to evaluate for any loss and recovery of any drill fluid, I believe. That's right. We um, we worked with the contractor to have a, an inadvertent return plan prepared, and that is a, a, a standard plan that any, con any contractor doing HDD needs to prepare, and that uh, has the details of what would be done to address that type of situation should it arise. And that plan was provided to uh, Ms. Deanne. Can you explain a little bit about the directional drilling under the uh, river and pond? I'll turn that back over to Abby. Sure. Yep. Yep. Um, if you don't mind, Brad, if you mind mm -hmm. going to the uh, the slide that has the sort of the definition sure. and whatnot. Yeah, that, I think that'll be helpful. 
This one? Or mm. that one? This is, yeah, the text is fine. Um, so it is, so I, I've put in the definition here just for uh, a clarity. So it is a surface launch system. In other words, there is no pits or anything involved with drilling. So there's a surface launched rig sitting on one side. In this case, the east side, right? The, the rig will perform what's known as pilot hole, usually in the range of about eight to 12 inch diameter. Um, the pilot hole will proceed at a given, you know, at a design angle down into the ground surface. And at which point it'll do a, a gradual curve and become <laughs> parallel to the ground surface and then um, sort of exit or pop out on the other side, the Western side in this case. Now, once the pilot hole is established, that is the critical part which helps with the transmission of fluid and everything else. The, the pilot hole is then reamed or enlarged in increments to the required final diameter that will allow for the installation of the mm -hmm. product pipe. In this case, it's the 16 inch HTPE that would be installed in tension. In other words, it'll be pulled into the borehole that has the drilling mud. And with the completion of the pullback process, that essentially completes the HTD process as such. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. If the system were to uh, have a leak somewhere, how would you know? Is that a, through pressure monitoring or some other separate system? <laughs> Just to clarify, yeah. which system are we referring to? Oh, they, um, no, yeah, I'm talking about post post construction once the when the system is operating. The meeting. Yeah, yeah. So the the closed system that's pumping the the geothermal you know condenser water that's tied to the heat pumps and that is on un, is under pressure and will be monitored. So if there was a significant leak. Um, or, you know, significant loss of pressure, that's one way. And then um, on the, there is some makeup component, uh, capability to the system. So also via um, monitoring that makeup. Can so, so, so I, I guess the second zoom. question along those lines of the, the fluid that's in the system, is it mostly water or what, what else is in it? It is water, yes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there is some inhibitor in the system um, because some of the piping, this this piping from basically that's you know underground is the HDPE plastic um, piping. Um, there's some you know carbon steel piping in the the plant itself um, that this is tied to directly. So there is a a small um, volume of inhibitor to help uh, prevent corrosion. <laughs> But otherwise, there's, this is just a, a water-based system. And that's, as my understanding is, which is uh, <laughs> old and probably out of date, but that's any any uh, heating and air conditioning system that uses water uh, to transfer heat uh, has those kinds of uh, uh, chemicals uh, added to the system in order to prevent uh, the deterioration of the containing pipe or whatever. Correct. Yeah, I agree with that. Other questions from commissioners? Could you talk a little bit about preparation of the site and then how it's proposed to be um, brought back to pre-existing conditions? So um, we don't have our contractor who could probably give you the best explanation for that. But um, what I have seen happen in other uh, fields, and I'm sure it will be here, is that uh, there's a whole water management piece that I think um, our uh, consultants could get into. But in terms of preparing the site, in this particular case, uh, we may have enough space to uh, strip the topsoil and leave it and berm it around the areas where the boreholes will be to kind of create a containment zone for where the drill rigs will actually sit. So we can't put the drill rigs out on, uh, obviously onto the soils as they exist. So they'll strip the topsoils, put down a gravel base, 
that'll allow the drill rigs to maneuver around and drill the wells. Um, at the and that will once that work is complete, and they get the piping in and everything else, we remove the gravel, put the loam back in, and then we restore the top of the fields, and we'll bring in a separate contractor. Uh, we have one uh, Clark Companies, which is has built most of our fields. We'll come back and do the top dressing and restore the lawn surfaces, replace the irrigation systems that are in there, um, and and put back some of the physical features such as the discus a shot put of some of those track and field events that uh, need to be moved out of the way temporarily. I don't know if that's enough of an answer, but that's kind of in a nutshell, the process. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing, Sarah, that you're looking at the uh, requirement for improvement over prior conditions rather than just reinstatement of prior conditions. Is yeah, and I guess two separate questions. So I was curious just both about how the athletic fields themselves were pro were proposed to be restored to their existing conditions, and then addressing those 310 CMR 10.585 standards um, that the commission would need to find a in, in whatever whatever way it's proposed that the existing project will um, result in an improvement over existing conditions. Yeah, so I mean, we'll certainly put the um, developed lawns back in the same condition they are now. We're not gonna change anything. The layouts won't change per se. The The bore field on the kind of east side is the current soccer field. The bore field in the upper left corner there is the, um, that's where the track events are, uh, are held. Um, so that will be restored as it was before. Um, those two areas kind of, uh, butt up against the current softball field. And so we're actually um, containing that as that will still be in use to be used during the, the operations out there. And then to the very left lower is the existing um, synthetic track field. Um, so in terms of putting back any impervious surfaces, no, we're gonna put back uh, the same surfaces that are there now, which is mostly grass. Uh, you know, if improvements are in terms of creating naturalized areas, um, I don't know that there's anywhere that we would be able to do that in this particular riverfront area and that we um, are maintaining the banks for the Army Corps, right? Because uh, it is a dam situation. Uh, they have their requirements there. Um, I would offer that in a, in a broader sense, our master landscape plan is, is starting to convert our campus where we are putting meadow grasses, you know, surface water features to take runoff rather than throwing it directly into storm mains. That's something that's happening incrementally by uh, per order the master plan across campus. So as we work on specific areas, we do uh, keep that uh, in the context, context of the, the program for those sites. Um, and uh, I think a good example will be Davis, if you haven't been over there, that that's lawn was converted to probably 20 to 30 percent meadow grass and plantings as opposed to just grass. Um, we have McCartney Hall under construction, which is going to have bioswales uh, and surface mitigation for runoff. Um, that will be completed next summer. So we're doing it institutionally. In this particular case, it's difficult for me to say that there's a restoration that we can do in that particular area that won't uh, compromise the program for the school. Is that true where the, the, the bank is sort of right up to the edge of the river, I'm thinking of looking especially in the upper left, there's no opportunity for restoration along the bank. Um, we have a, a future project up there. I think there is a bank uh, stabilization project we need to do there. We have a second one that's down um, below the Lamont Bridge. Um, and those are future projects that we need to pay attention to. Um, we do have, um, jogging paths out there and walkways that are used by the public. We wouldn't want to compromise those um, to, you know, enjoy the river as you go up uh, north towards the high school. So um, not a lot of space out there. I know that we actually have to close off some of those routes because of the extent of the, the work that they're doing, yeah. uh, which we regret, unfortunately. So they're... Um, does the uh, landscape management plan anticipate the eradication of non-native invasive species that will be gone forever? 
<laughs> Don't we wish? Um, we do advocate for native plant species in the master landscape plan, and that's we're actively planting those on campus. Um, in terms of eradication, we don't see a lot of that on campus because it is kind of a, a horticultural piece that yeah. is managed that way. Yeah, um, I know I have not weed. I've been battling for five years in my backyard, so um, I, I would join the fight if there is one. <laughs> I mean, just north of the, the dam, there is a uh, prior mitigation area from um, installation of the athletic turf field project that was a permanent invasive and, and planted area. So that, that's already being done there. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're also going to put everything back to the same elevation, too, as there's some floodplain out there. Yes, exactly. Hmm. Good point. Yeah, and, and just to be clear, all of, although the, the overall work did include a pretty substantial amount of bordering land subject to flooding um, alteration, that the entirety of that is temporary, correct? Yes. So I'm sure you've considered this, but is there a reason why the the ore field on the upper left is there rather than in the track, sort of where the track loop is? Because I'm just asking because that would put a lot of the work area further away from the the river. Um, uh, I can't speak to the placements of those. I, it may have been economic decision because of potential destruction to the uh, synthetic track surface with vehicle traffic over it and so forth. Um, the drilling that's going to go out there, um, it's, it's, it's mm, what, over a year? Somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, um, a lot of activity on those bore fields. Eight, um, 18 after, months, yeah. Charlie. 18 months. Yeah. Um, so that particular area, we have some that like shot put and discus and so forth. It was just a, um, I, I think, a, a, a more logical place to put it, even though it is the proximity of the river is closer. Um, but everything we're doing, we're doing to protect that frontage to the river um, in terms of how it's being approached. I think we're also trying to keep our athletics program going, and uh, <laughs> the track is essential to that. Um, uh, as is the infield of that, which is the the rugby field, I think. Um, we were able to move some of the track events to adjacent uh, areas uh, to keep that going, but uh, the track would be difficult to relocate. Yeah. I'm impressed with the overall scope of what Smith is trying to do and uh, uh, the more I learn about this, the more I understand what a commitment is involved and how there are so many uh, trade-offs that have to be made um, in the process of pursuing it. What I'm wrestling with is that phrasing in uh, that provision at 310 uh, CMR that Sarah just um, referred to that says that at a minimum proposed work shall result in an improvement over existing conditions. And so I, while I can understand that, yeah, in this, this creates improvements um, for the entire campus and for the community. And um, I, I'm wondering how, and this may be a, a, a conscom technicality, uh, Sarah, about, you know, how broadly can we interpret the uh, efforts to improve? Normally, we restrict it to the work area, to the uh, to, to the area that has been previously disturbed and is being um, now in, brought back to a condition that is in, an improvement over the prior condition. Normally, that's a very narrowly interpreted uh, requirement. So that's the thing I'm wrestling with now. Can we can we interpret that more broadly and say, yeah, you're doing a lot of good stuff in a lot of different places, and we let that count as an improvement. So that, that that's what I'm wrestling with right now. Uh, yeah, I mean, there there isn't a hard and fast rule about what is and what's not an improvement, and it's different for every project. Um, this 
project and as DEP acknowledged as well is a little bit unique that it's, you know, it's entirely temporary impacts, but a temporary impact is still an impact and work is work. Um, so the commission does need to be able to make that finding in, in one way or another, um, but there is some flexibility about how to do that. Um, I know that there is in, in the works of bank stabilization project, like directly to the north of the, um, the yeah. um, Mill River sort of west um, yeah. area that Beth had asked about. Um, so the, the commission could potentially condition it that you know, future projects will require some additional level of uh, habitat improvement or something like that. If if there's really just no flexibility to provide it here, uh -huh. if this is temporary work, then would it be acceptable if there was a temporary improvement? <laughs> Does that not make any sense? Temporary is tough. I mean, usually if an improvement is being made, it's it's something that um, you know is is built into a project and will be carried on. Moving forward, I don't know what a temporary improvement might might be. Right, we, case. we we usually have an operating and maintenance plan to go with improvements, so we know that they're uh, going to be pursued in perpetuity or more or less in perpetuity. Uh, so, yeah, I, I I don't think in it. I I don't I don't know what a temporary improvement would would uh, mean and whether we could count it um, if it were only temporary. Oh, yeah, right. kind of. Sorry. What, what, yeah, what's what's kind of maybe unique in this situation, and I don't have a lot of experience with this, but um, what, everything we're doing, we're, we're doing to make it as though we never did anything. Um, it's not as though we're changing right. the landscape. Um, right. Is there even an opportunity just to do some tree plantings? somewhere i mean it it need ne need not necessarily be like in the athletic fields but somewhere within the riverfront area I and mean, i know that the the western portion of the of the river is basically considered a dike system and the trees had to be removed there but is there any possibility to do that elsewhere um uh, there's always opportunities to do things on campus. I guess it's trying to figure out what that might be. Um, but we would certainly be open to that. Yeah. How would this fit in with the uh, mass DP and eventually the Northampton regulations um, where, where they're putting an emphasis on climate control? Maybe there's a way of improving the climate control aspect of the MSD regulations. But was that yeah, audible? We, you were breaking up on my end. Uh, yeah, I didn't well, hear that. The, the mass DEP is going to, you know, they're introducing climate control into the Wetlands Act. I'm wondering maybe. There are improvements to that aspect. Ah. Let's face it, this whole project is an improvement as far as climate control. Yeah. So moving away from fossil fuel usage is a net improvement within future regulations. We don't know what those are going to be yet, but yes, no. they're working on it. Yeah, I mean it's not one of the the interests of the act. So the yeah, so it, it doesn't. Although it comes into play absolutely in the larger picture and you know makes a lot of sense moving forward as if like a really admir admirable and you know, ambitious goal to meet, the commission still is looking at the at the narrower interests of the act and the requirements of three ten yeah. CMR. But you know, yeah. as I said, there's flexibility as to how to interpret that overall improvement. Restoration done right um, seems sufficient to me. It's not a stumbling block. Um. Charlie, I don't know what type of grasses might be out there. I mean, a, a lot of it is constrained by the athletic field, but is there any opportunity just to use a like a better seed mix? Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> you, you mean not on 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 non playing surfaces? Yeah, um, or even east of the river somewhere. I mean, there there's a basic like here's your stabilization mix, and then there's like ooh, this one has pollinator plants, and 
and other um, native species in it? Um, it could well be. Um, we, I guess we, it, it's, it, it's kind of site specific where we might choose to do that. Um, maybe the, the hillside leading up towards the woods or something. I'm trying to, um, kind of figure out what, how we dance, how to answer that question. I'm not sure I, I can, um, but yeah, why, why not? We can look at, um, um, areas that aren't, you know, actively used for athletics and see if there's another way to treat those. Yeah. And those border regions, certainly. I, I personally would feel a lot more comfortable with that, um, that the outside of the athletic fields, I understand that the turf on the fields has to be of a specific, specific type and height and maintenance, et cetera. But there are spaces around the fields, it seems that could yeah. be naturalized with, with native plants that along the lines of what Sarah was saying, could be some native grasses, pollinator yeah. plants it seems, without being there at the moment and, and looking right. at specific sites. I, I think we currently do that on the island. Um, mm. It's kind of naturalized out there. It, it's changed, the character of the island has changed and it's, uh, some of the larger trees were removed and uh, I'm way back when I don't know why, but uh, it is more naturalized out there now. Um, but the, the I believe it states that uh, we should see an improvement over existing conditions. Yeah, I'm just using that as an example of an area that I think has improved. So we can look at that. Um, I see. Under under the topic of long term improvements or degradation, for that matter, what impact do you think the well field will have on the hydraulic conductivity of uh, subsurface movement of water from from the athletic fields over into the river? Mm. Will it force more overland flow and reduce the subsurface flow? We have not, um, so we do geothermal as well. We've not seen that on other, it's a really interesting question, um, but we have not seen that on other projects um, being an issue. Bill, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm not aware of issues either. I mean, we are, it's not a, you know, there's a, well, there's a large number of bores here. Um, you know, the, the diameter and size of those are compared to the surrounding is, is relatively minimal. Um, you know, so there's not a large ob obstruction there. Mm -hmm. Do you have a sense of what the, the ratio is of the, the projected area of all the 200 and some boreholes and the grout <clears throat> versus the whole dimension? Yeah, I I don't know what that is off the top of my head, but we could come up with that pretty uh, quickly. Um, it's it's will be a fairly small, a pretty small pretty number. Small. Yeah. yeah, the spacing is what, Bill? Twenty to twenty-five feet, and the diameter is six. Yeah, inch. there's six-inch diameter, and there's 20, 20 feet between each bore. Um, mm -hmm. So you got four hundred square feet of bore area, and you know. Uh, the uh, inch square inches on, on the um, six inch diameter of the bore itself. So it's probably pretty minor. It's pretty yeah. small. Yeah. yeah. Are these bores going to be capped? Are the caps going to be visible on the surface? There won't be anything visible on the surface. Um, and by capped, um, they're they're not necessarily there's there's not a a capping requirement. Like if I'm not sure what what exactly you're meaning, but if it's a I mean the grout comes to the top of the bore where the pipe will will um, you know the pipe will be turning at approximately five feet below the surface where um, it'll transition to horizontal. Um, so the you know, the drilling itself occurs um, from the <clears throat> surface or generally the surface, but then that'll be trenched down and, and, and the piping will be five to six feet below the, below the surface grade. So you won't see anything there. And there's no, there's no, you know, steel or physical like 
cap that would cover it. The bent, the grouting um, meets the um, water well requirements and that for, you know, um, sort of the capping condition. Thank you. And just going back to that area, it's about 0.1 to 0.2%. Okay. And David, you're uh, more uh, expert in hydrology. Uh, does that ratio seem like a truly de minimis ratio to you? Uh, it, it does to me. Um, uh, to the extent I understand uh, these systems, yeah, I would say. Yeah, it looks like a lot on the plan, but you have to imagine that 25 feet between each boreholes. Yeah. A, lot, a lot of area. And the, the process of drilling doesn't create um, you know, additional compaction and reducing hydraulic conductivity around the boreholes either, I presume. No. no. Sarah, I'm the waste stream. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Kevin. I, I'm remembering when uh, we permitted the uh, uh, the uh, artificial turf uh, athletic field that the uh, river bank actually had to be planted with um, a native species. The, the, I, I, this was many years ago, but I think I'm remembering that correctly. I don't remember. Uh, and I, I, I'm, I go by there fairly frequently, but I don't remember what the operating and maintenance plan was, or whether those, uh, uh, whether the, the now many years later, the native species are indeed the the dominant presence on the riverbanks. Uh, anybody on this call know about that? I'm just saying, well, if, if there's a way to include that kind of uh, perennial improvement of the riverbank with native species as part of this. Yeah, so so that was required in the area of the footbridge. Um, it wouldn't be possible here because this is actually a dike um, and it, it's not possible to have woody vegetation on, on a dike per Office of Dam Safety. That's right. That's why we had to allow the removal of the trees on the yeah. northern portion. Yeah, because right. they never should have been there in the first place. An Office of yeah. Dam Safety right. and an inspection right. said, oh, what are these big trees doing here you're going to get rid of them um but th <laughs> those areas shifted over time that were required to be permanently planted but they at, at least last time i checked they were still there and we were getting reports on them but it, as, as you may be able to tell what i find myself doing i don't know about other commissioners but this seems like a great thing glad it's happening and i'm trying to figure out a way to say yes um but just uh, thinking about what the additional given the constraints that we have to operate within. And I think, you know, Sarah's repeated reminding of us that we have some flexibility in how we determine what an improvement looks like. Um, and so it may be enough that with uh, the applicant's commitment to wherever practical and possible uh, to add more native vegetation anywhere in this general area, while it might not be possible to do within the athletic fields themselves, uh, there might be patches in different places. There might be some on the other side of the river, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying to talk myself into uh, yeah. believing that that's good enough. Um, <laughs> no, I, way. Uh, Sarah, I've got a question for Sarah. Is this, would something, um, you know, if, if they were to incorporate some water quality monitoring of the river uh, to detect any possible leak and contamination would would uh, uh would that be considered an improvement i mean there i don't know that there's any water quality monitoring of that type currently um if it would be done as mitigation from impacts to from this project i, I don't know if that would be an ongoing i'm going for you know yeah. term long term issues could that possibly fall into that category of an improvement <laughs> There, there, there's no hard and fast rule for interpretation of the improvement in this case. You're thinking heat pollution? I'm, I'm thinking, um, yeah, that would be one, but um, so, so temperature, but also 
uh, possible uh, release of drilling fluids over long term periods of time or or um, leaking of the um, um, the PVC IHP the, the polyethylene pipe under the river um, you know who knows what um, you know all this is is a lot of movement of water going back and forth and um, up from the 800 foot wells and down under the river and a lot of opportunity even though it's a closed system uh, the, the best systems in the world always leak a little because currently you know, Smith College has got every known tester and known demand for water quality <laughs> all along uh, various areas along the river. Well, and, they do have a lot, I know. And, yeah. and uh, Bob Bob Newton and Amy Rhodes have done a great job of, of doing that. Yeah. Um, but they don't, you know, they 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 wouldn't detect everything. And I'm just I'm just hunting for something that might be helpful in terms of the project and and would be viewed as an improvement. Yeah, they're they're currently set up for uh, silt and sand in the in the river column. As you know, because of the drawdown for every seven years. But um, I don't know if any of those are adapted to detect um, leaks of uh, at night coming. I don't know. It's the place of the particles would be very small. Um, on the two. Uh, previous uh, bore fields, Davis Lawn and at the Quadrangle. Um, following those, well, in conjunction with the completion of those projects, we did hire Berkshire Design for both sites to design the new landscape that's going back onto those uh, bore fields. I, I could bring it to uh, the administration here that we would do the same here. We'd bring in Berkshire if there's opportunities to do supplemental plannings around the perimeters and so forth, uh, in conjunction with Clark companies restoring the athletic surfaces, we could pose that as an option. Uh, we can study it and see if there's opportunities. That it sounds helpful to me. Yes. I'm in favor of that as well. Agreed. Other questions from commissioners? I only have one final question, and that's um, <clears throat> how you'll be dealing with the groundwater discharge from the project. Um, I know that the, the, there you go. Okay. Uh, thanks for the segue, Sarah. <laughs> that was really nice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Construction to watering. So uh, this is our general process that we've been following on the quad district, and we've uh, slightly different detail. I'll mention that in a second, but uh, this is what we plan to do here. So we start by before any of this work happens, obtain a groundwater sample, um, following the recommendations for the uh, National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System (DRGP), so the Dewatering and Remediation General Permit. Um, so follow them for their guidance on the testing requirements. Based on the results, we determine if the groundwater can be discharged under either a CGP, Construction General, or that DRGP. Assuming we can, that's how we will proceed, and I'll get to those details in a moment. If we can't, then that material, uh, that uh, groundwater will be trucked offsite. So, um, but depending on the ground, uh, if the groundwater quality is favorable, um, the appropriate NOI will be uh, filed for the right permit. Um, and then the drill water will be routed to an on-site excava excavated detention basin for settling, then into a series of fractionation tanks uh, for storage, additional settling, and then followed by filtering. And that filtering, we found that bag filters don't work so well here, uh, just because the fine nature of the particles. And so therefore we are use a system of sand filters and uh, granular activated carbon. It's what's being used now and probably would be used again. Uh, and as you may know, uh, GAC, as it's called, is used to remove chemicals on all sorts of projects. So you'll you get some serious filtration here, and that's been used to benefit on, on this project in terms of the water quality that is being discharged to a storm drain. Um, 
we'd of course uh, conduct the compliance to watering sampling in accordance with the permit. Um, and it, yeah, I already noted the next bullet. Um, drill spoils and settlement from the frack tanks, they'll be trucked off site to an appropriate facility. So those are handled separately. <clears throat> and the last little bit there is just a general comment that the only time the system's really interacting with groundwater is before the system is really the system. It's the temporary drilling Seems process. Yeah. But the water yeah. that's coming out of the ground, we got to manage it. Once that system is in place, long term, you've got these, we call them boreholes or bores, but those are filled with a grout material and it has the piping inside of it carrying the fluids. So the chances of interaction with the groundwater are greatly reduced versus, yeah. say, a, a drinking water well. Uh, so um, no state permit requirements. There's, of course, the city permit that's required, and we will um, file for that. There's no state permit required because it is a closed loop system, not an open loop system. Hmm. Good. Thank you. Yep. Other questions from commissioners? Uh, just curious about the GAC um, design. Um, do you have any design criteria as to how much, uh, you know, how many bed volumes and so on um, you would treat before you would change the GAC out? Yeah, that type of work is done. Um, and that's done by an engineer on behalf of the uh, contractor. That's how it was handled on the current project. So offhand, I, I couldn't tell you. Any other questions or no. comments? Where will the frack tanks be located during the work? Uh, we do have a plan for that. I'm not sure that it, I don't think that's in the slide deck. Um, Jim, do you have that plan? Some more handy that you could. Brad, I have it. I can I can pull it up. Oh, great. This is Bob Lambert. I'm a project manager with with Smith College. So I'm gonna stop sharing here. I'll I'll put it on screen, Brad. If you want to talk through it, or okay. I can talk through it too. Yep. So if you look kind of in the center of the plan, you'll see that detention basin. Thanks, Bob, where the hand is. And to the right of it are the three tanks. Okay. Do you have any concern that that area would flood if we got an intense rain or something? Oh, from the... So, um, I don't know that having the tanks there would increase the risk of it, the tension, the detention basin. Um, should we anticipate some significant rains like we've had in the last several years? Um, I think uh, we could include in our specs that uh, what fluids in there would need to go into a tank so that we would avoid that type of situation. Cool, yeah, sounds good. Sorry. Any other questions? Anything else the uh, applicant wants to present? Or add? Are there any questions uh, or comments from the public? If not, um, someone want to make a motion to close the hearing? And I, I, I will say that a motion to close would indicate that we feel comfortable, we have enough information um, to make a ruling. So move. There a, there's a motion from, I couldn't tell who spoke. Paul. Uh, Paul. Paul, is there a second? A second. Is it made and seconded? Um, 
Any further discussion? If not, all in favor, Sarah, roll call. Paul? Yes. David? Yes. Beth? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Mason? Yes. And Kevin? Yes. All right, the hearing is closed. Um, as you can tell from my earlier comments, I think this is a very worthwhile thing and want to make sure that we're not stretching too far um, the rules that we have to operate within in order to say okay to it. Um, and a couple of the ideas that have come up make me feel more uh, yeah. positively about that. that the flexibility that uh, Sarah indicated about uh, what constitutes an improvement that with the uh, applicant, especially the, the last point about bringing in Berkshire design to try and maximize anywhere in this whole area, uh, native plantings and naturalizing um, uh, uh, alongside the uh, athletic fields and so forth. That makes me feel like, yeah, I, I, I could in good conscience then say uh, that this will be an improvement over prior conditions, um, not just a restoration of prior conditions. Yeah. So, I see a lot of head nodding from other commissioners. Uh, so uh, is someone want to make a motion to uh, uh, grant an order of conditions? And then uh, we can talk about what might be included in that order of conditions. Is there such a motion? I'm moved. By Mason, is there a second? By David. Um, if no further discussion, uh, we have, well, actually, no. <laughs> the further discussion is what we need to do first. Um, so we've articulated, and Sarah, I don't know how many of our thoughts uh, you've co collected there, which would be the conditions, because there's all the standard conditions for sure. Um, uh, the uh, uh, DEP and uh, other uh, natural heritage conditions that have been mentioned, those would have to be included. Um, and the, the and additional then, ones that I heard were um, uh, working with Berkshire Design to create a landscape and planting plan for the riverfront area and identify areas uh, within that resource where additional plantings and other work could be done to create an improvement. And also adding the condition that um, if a flooding situation or a significant storm is anticipated, uh, that the, the o and plan require provisions right. for pumping of the, the yeah. base so that doesn't flood. Good. Yeah, because even though it, uh, Beth's comment or question about the tanks, even though the tanks are closed, there's that settling swale adjacent to them that is not closed. So th that would need, if there were going to be a significant rain event, a, a plan for how you would deal with an, uh, a significant rain event. Any other conditions, commissioners, think we ought to add? Those are the two key for me. Yep. Okay. I would add nothing. All right. Then we motion uh, motions made and seconded, and we have uh, a list of uh, standard and additional conditions. Um, all in favor, Sarah, roll call. All right. Paul. Yes. David. Yes. Beth. Yes. Melissa. Yes. Mason. Yes. And Kevin. Yes. Right, unanimous. Thank you. Good luck. We look forward to seeing how it all goes over the next many months. Yeah. <laughs> Thank right. you for your time. Thank all you. Right. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Now we'll move on to the cutlery. Um, let me see here. Get over to. Well, I can't find that screen right now. But let's just say the the. Uh, uh, Notice of intent for improvements uh, at the old cutlery site. Um, and so uh, with, without me being able to find that screen where I can read the language properly, uh, who's ever here presenting for that, please, you're on. Good evening. Uh, Barry Fogel here from Keegan Worland on behalf of the applicant. I see Alan Verson, who is the applicant, is on, and Lyons Witten, the, the engineer, uh, LSP, who's uh, in charge of the project. Hello again. Hello. Uh, Hello. So this is a new notice of intent. You folks approved a an order of conditions last year and a half or so for 
a much more extensive project uh, that turned out after bidding and speaking with contractors became non-feasible based on financial inability. Mm -hmm. um, it just was, you know, whether it was post COVID or just the way, it, just the scale of the project, just the tree removal alone, which you remember was quite extensive, was, was a moving target and a growing number. Um, so Lyons went back to the drawing board to see if there was something scaled back that would enhance the temporary solution that's out there now that's making the conditions under Chapter 21E safe uh, for public health safety and the environment for the foreseeable future. And he's come up with this remedial action that would uh, restore, rebuild a portion of the a uh, stone wall down along the river to stabilize a section of the bank uh, in the floodplain and riverfront area, and then extend that a little bit, um, which would eliminate a significant amount of what you know possible erosion that can occur and keep any soil with the contaminants out of the river. So the intent would be that we would file a certificate of compliance request that would state that the work was not done under the prior order um, and proceed with this project. Um, we have uh, all the abutter notification responses are back to Sarah from Allen. We have the letter from Natural Heritage with their comment that they, with certain conditions um, that they would determine that there would be no take, no, no um, uh, problem. And um, we have responses for you to the few comments that MassDEP uh, uh, sent out when they signed a, a file number. So we're prepared to address that with you here tonight too. So depending on how you'd like to proceed, you know, maybe uh, Lyons can call up a figure and kind of show you where the work would be done. If you recall, there was a significant issue of, you know, we were going to create a new access off of um, Riverside. That's gone away. Right. The access would be back through the parking area. Um, so that whole rigmarole is eliminated, if you will. Um, but if that's how you'd like to proceed, we can have Lyons uh, walk you through a little bit of um, on one of the plans as to what the proposal is. Yeah, I think... Uh... Uh, uh, an overview uh, and then uh, answers to the questions that I know you just got, like we did yesterday, uh, or the comments um, that just came in on the 23rd. So uh, those would be two things I'd like to have you address. All right, Lyons, if you could share your screen with the plan, um, walk folks through it quickly. Okay. Good evening. Hello. Good evening. Uh, for those of you I haven't met, uh, my name is Lyons Witten. I'm an LSB with OHI Engineering. Uh, I'm sharing um, one of two screens that are really important to this project. Um, Pardon me, Lyons. Can you actually pull up a screen that's the like a larger overview of the site so you can locate where this is before you go to these close-ups? Sure. Yeah, just to give folks a, I'll call it a locus figure. Yep. Thank you. Certainly. So can you see this topographic map? No. Yeah, you're looking at the screen. Yeah. Yep. Should be should be in the center of the screen. I'll make the make the other one smaller. Yeah, I think you have to stop sharing the first one and then restart a share. Okay. There. Ah, 
How's that? I, I, I was actually thinking more of you know, do we not have a plan that shows the cutlery property with the, yeah here, the, here's the there. here's a single plan with the cutlery property good the uh zoom in a bit if you could So the purple is the, oh my goodness. Oh. Time to go home. My lights have gone off. <laughs> oh no. Oh my goodness. I have plant lights in my office and they, they go off when it's sunset. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, the purple line is the mass DEP hazardous waste site the outline of that, the um, green outline is filled raceway. Um, and the this dark blue line up near the top is the approximate extent of the raceway levy, the area that is still visible and recognizable as levy. And um, and that is the area where uh, this project will occur. So it's the upstream portion of the cutlery site that we're here to talk about tonight. Um, the Mill River flows from the top to the bottom in this figure, in this aerial photograph. Um, and so the, the part we're talking about is this, this upper part uh, with the dark blue line, if you can uh, oh. If you can see that. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, that's what we want to see there. So I am now going to switch to a much uh, closer view. And I guess I need to share that. And that looks like... That looks like that. Okay. So can we see this now? Yep. Yes. Okay. So the left side of this particular sheet on the on the plan set is the downstream end of the blue line we were looking at previously. Okay. Uh, and the river flows from right to left on this figure. Um, and the existing stone retaining wall, the downstream end of it is right where my cursor is going up and mm -hmm. down the screen. Okay. So this project involves repair of the existing stone wall from its downstream extent, um, whoops, too fast, sorry, too fast. Um, so this is the next sheet upstream and it involves going up to this point, basically where the beach runs out and um, the dry laid stone wall ends and the uh, masonry stone, vertical masonry stone wall begins, if you're familiar with that. Um, and that stone wall is shown on, on the next sheet upstream, but that is not the subject of the proposed work tonight. So going back downstream, the... Um, the repairs we're talking about start here and go upstream. They're the retaining wall at the base of the steep bank um, below the levee um, adjacent to the Mill River. 
And in addition to the, the stone wall in the upstream extent is about six feet high during most, along most of the river, the stone wall is four feet high on average. And down at this downstream end uh, where we're looking now, it approaches two feet high. Um, it gets lower and lower. I guess they, when they originally designed it, it, that's what was necessary to protect the bank. Lyons, if I could, could you um, scroll down? If you, if this is in the NOI package, do you have the, those photographs that show the area? I can, I can pull up the photographs. Yes. Yeah, I think that might. You know, it's easy to okay. see. It's harder to yep. see it on the plan, but when you, if you walk folks through with using those photos um it'll give them an idea of what's there and what you're you know how, where you're making changes one second g to the noi package for for the commissioners. G is in George. All right. So you're still seeing the plan. I need to stop sharing that. And... No, we're seeing photos now, I think. Oh, you are? Yes. Okay. yes. Yeah. Excellent. Photos. Excellent. So this top photo, you're looking upstream. You're looking up the river. Um, under my cursor, the, the red arrow is approximately the upstream extent of the proposed work. Um, and then as, as we come downstream, you can see an area in under my cursor right now that's outlined in orange on the bank. And the wall below that has fallen, it's toppled over uh, due to energy from the river, from the Mill River. And because the wall fell over, the orange area delineates a location where uh, a number of years ago we had to do erosion controls and bank stabil bank stabilization. Um, and in this photograph with a slight uh, snow on the ground surface, it's easy to see areas where the um, where the wall has fallen over. So because the wall fell over, there zoom is in a bit, Lions, if you can. Can you zoom in a couple uh, of points? There's a plus sign. Yeah, there you go. That helps. Okay, good. There. So you can see that the, the wall, the top of the wall ran along here, and then all of a sudden the wall's down on the beach, and then the wall's back <laughs> up, the height of oh, the yes. wall's back up here. And on the right side of the photograph, you can see that the height of the wall goes down again. Um, these are all areas where the wall is toppled over, it's no longer supporting the bank, and the bank is eroding into the river. So the problem just, with that just, is that- Just to be clear, Lyons, you're talking about part of this project is to take those stones that are obvious below the orange polygon and re re pull those back up on and the- Put wall. them back. So the, the majority of this project involves taking stones that have fallen off the wall and put them back on the wall, rebuild the wall using the stones that are below it that obviously came from it. Um, and just to, like to restore the height of the wall and and prevent additional erosion of the bank into the river. Right, and just for, for wetland purposes, what that means is it's gonna re recreate floodplain volume where those stones are pulled out of where they fall into and it will reoccupy floodplain volume where they used to be. <laughs> so it's sort of a net, it, while you're gaining, by pulling those stones back up onto the wall, we're gaining flood volume at the lower elevation and, and occupying it at the higher elevation um, as it once was. And the, you know th those square footages and cubic footages have been um, updated on the page of the form three that Sarah asked us to update to, to take the square feet footprint of where that's happening and, and calculate the cubic footage of floodplain volume. 
Yeah. Here's another another good there photograph of, of an area where the wall has fallen over and, and needs to be put back in place. And then Lyons, is there a segment where you are also planning on adding stones in a certain section? Yes. And, so yeah. at the so if this is the downstream, this is the downstream extent of the existing stone wall. It's a couple of feet high. Um, and we're proposing to add 105 feet of new stone wall that would extend the existing stone wall downstream. And that's this small line of stones here that ends at this point. And that is to stabilize some of the- and That is the stabilized the bank that does not have a retaining wall, yeah. but is eroding into the river. <clears throat> and does contain heavy metals like the rest of the bank. So yeah. we're trying to prevent erosion of heavy metals into the river um, by rebuilding existing wall and extending the wall, this 105 feet. Um, we don't need to extend it further than that because further downstream, A, the river becomes uh, wider and B, there is a, uh, a larger, a substantially larger floodplain that absorbs the energy of floods. And we do not see erosion on the bank uh, down there in the same way that we see it up here. And how many trees, again, you, does this image, so, are those circles showing canopy of trees that would? Those circles are showing, canopy of existing trees. Um, there will be one to three trees in in this area near this circular feature of uh, erosion controls so that we can get equipment from the top of the levee here down onto what I'll call the beach below the uh, retaining wall. And then our work area will be uh, 10 feet wide um, out from the base of the wall and in this case the proposed wall at the downstream end. Where so is the a, lines where is the footprint of the where the stones would be placed in so temporary so in order to access most of the existing stone wall we need to put the 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 beach is too narrow to get equipment from this downstream end to this upstream end. So in, in this hatched rectangle here, we're proposing to put, uh, to temporarily place stone in the river. So that would be uh, land subject to flooding um, or land below water. And, mm -hmm. and so then we could get equipment from the downstream extent of the work area to the upstream areas so that we can rebuild the wall. And then one when the project is over, lines, all those one stones of these out. plans show that, the footprint of that? The, it, you're looking at the footprint of it. It's all right here, right. it's 194 square feet. Can you zoom in on that a little bit more? I can try. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there we go. There we go. So the mean low water line here comes in and becomes very narrow and the beach itself is, is rather steep. You can walk across there, but you couldn't, you couldn't bring a bobcat or a mini excavator through there to, to get from one side to the other. So we're proposing to fill that with stone for the duration of the project. And then when the upstream repairs are done, when we're, when we're backing ourselves out and finishing the project, that stone will be picked up and used in part anyway, to build this new 105 feet of wall as we work our way out of the project. If there's excess stone that isn't used on that wall, it will be removed from the site. Can you show where the access would come from? Is there one of the figures that you, I know you showed it? Yes, here. so- What about from the upper area? From the parking. Oops, wrong way. Sorry. Hold on. So in order to get down on the beach, this is the top of the levee up here. In order to get down the beach, we will go down this slope 
make the corner, and then come this way and, and do all our work from up here down onto the beach. And at, at the end of each workday, all the equipment will be brought back up um, to the top of the levee. So no equipment is left on the beach uh, at night. I, I meant, where's the access from the parking I, lot? Can you show that? I can. Great. So uh, the next sheet I'm going to show you is to the left of this one. So here's here's the erosion controls, uh, the area we we're just talking about where we go down to the beach. Um, the access to the property for this work uh, will be from the left down in the bottom corner of the left. That is the Valley Home Improvement paved parking lot. And at the property line, there is an existing uh, chain link fence with a gate. And we would use that gate uh, and their parking lot and access through here and do our staging in this portion of the property and then go down onto uh, near the water level at the below the wall to do the repairs. Lines, the plans show alteration of land underwater uh, where the, the, I guess, beach access is proposed, but that seems contradictory to natural heritage's required condition that all work occur in the dry. No, because I, I spoke with her about that and her, her concern was would all, would the equipment we'll say the feet of the equipment or the tracks of the equipment, would they stay dry or would they be going into the water? And and I explained that the purpose of doing the stone was so that the equipment would be up above water level and stay there. Um, and if the, if when we put the erosion controls in, if there's a, a flood event where the water level comes up and starts to encroach on the upland side of the erosion control so that were we to go down there with equipment, the, the tracks of the equipment would get wet, that we wouldn't be working that day. We would wait till the water receded to the river side of the erosion controls. But is, is the mean annual low water incorrectly delineated in, in that case? No, the, the mean annual low water is, is out here, Sarah. And it, it does encroach in where the stone is. That's why we have to put the stone in there so that we're up above the water. Yeah. So just to be and then when the project is over, we'll take the stone out of the water. Yeah. So the idea is to, to put lions, lions, excuse me one second. The, the, the answer, Sarah, is that the comment of working in the dry is once these stones are placed, all the work then would be done above water. Cla right. Lions clarified that with natural heritage. So I just to try to keep it moving. So that I mean, We've, you've got the idea that the the access will come in from the parking lot. It'll go down an established route. There'll be some few trees removed for this. These stones would be placed to work on the upstream side. And as the work proceeds to restore the the, the wall material, up, the stones up on the wall, those placed stones, the footprint would be pulled out and used to create that extra length of low wall in areas where there might be erosion, but there is no wall now. Um, Correct. It's kind of, I mean, keeping it simple, you know, it's sort of a, a much reduced measure to prevent the erosion and extend the life of the temporary solution in accordance with Chapter 21A. Um, I mean, we can come back to any of this, but I, I do want to, if I can, I, if, Lions, if you, I can share my screen. Um, I don't know if you need to, yeah, let me try that. If that appears, this, I've, I've taken the DEP comments and identified them as one, two, three, and four. So number one was that the work was submitted as a limited project and the filing 
fee was under category four one. And of course, if there's some additional fee required, you know, we can address that. I, Sarah, I don't know if you know what the amount is, just let us know, or if that's something we deal with with DEP, but that, that's not a problem, obviously. Um, they, one of their comments was to send the NOI to Natural Heritage, and we've already done that, and we got their response back. Um, so they got the NOI, we've issued, they issued their letter, and and, and again, while they, DEP said, you know, and I said earlier, this is not a request to amend the order of conditions. You know, we're prepared for a certificate of compliance to be issued that indicates the prior approved work was not conducted to close out that prior order. Um, DEP suggested that since it's a limited project that, you know, attempting to comply with the performance standards and the riverfront standards, um, he said, DEP suggested, Mark suggested that you could review this as a redevelopment project. I actually think that's um, sort of not appropriate. We're under 1058.4 and not 1058.5. Um, you know, and under 1058.4, you know, because of what we want to do is to stabilize that, there really there is, the, is no alternative to doing it. It's the minimal remedial action that the LSP has determined. Um, and we're actually avoiding significant adverse impact to the riverfront area by stabilizing the bank, which is in the riverfront area. Um, by restoring the collapsed section of the stone wall, the project is the most practical way to stabilize the bank in the bordering lands with the flooding and within the RFA, they all overlap and reduce that erosion of impacted soil. Um, and then of course, under 1053-4, you know, you have up to 5,000 square feet or 10% of the riverfront area. We're at something like 367 square feet of riverfront. At least that's the number I saw in the NOI. Um, so we're certainly far less than 5,000 square feet. So we meet that standards and, and we're doing, the work is to stabilize the bank, um, restore, portions of the BLSF. So those areas are protected. Um, and again, the natural heritage conditions will ensure that rare species habitat is protected. The last question DEP had was about the figure four, and he was asking, was there a conversion factor used in Lyons? You know, I, I know you have the answer to that in terms of converting, what was it, 1929 to 1988, something yes. like that? So the, the conversion factor is that you remove 0 0.663 feet from one to get the to the other so it's they're in the area of uh the cutlery um, so it, it's changed by it's a difference of eight inches eight inches right yeah. there. 0.79 inches yeah or so, 7.9 inches sorry yeah I mean, again, if, if, if we think it might be useful if folks have specific questions, um, we can go to the plans or the NOI, but um, we wanted to give you that brief overview and then leave it open to your questions. I have, I have a question. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, it seems like the previous order of conditions allowed for the removal of a lot more trees and that this uh, new uh, order of conditions, if issued, would uh, have fewer trees removed and provide um, sort of more original shading of the river, which had been a concern to us a couple of years ago in terms of uh, the water temperature and for the fish habitat uh, going up with less shading. So it seems like this may represent a reinstituting of more shading. Absolutely. Yes. Now, it the reason it's retaining the trees, shading that's already there. Yeah. Well, hold on. The, the reason. Yeah, that's what it sounds like. But the reason those trees, Paul, were going to be cut was to try to pull soil that they were growing in that was part of the 21 East site and put it into the pile and capped it. So we're not achieving that step, but we're the trees which are growing just fine and providing shading would will stay in place. Those very yeah. large trees. It's that's what I understand. Yeah. yeah. Barry, I guess to that point, so the, the reason the prior application 
presented so much disturbance was because you were hoping to close out your your response and just be done with it. This doesn't do that. <laughs> you, you're going to have these ongoing maintenance responsibilities. So that's correct. What so what will that look like? Is this a, a repair and um, assessment of the wall, like in perpetuity? Well, the Lions, the LSP has an annual sort of inspection and reporting that he does to DEP. And then every five years, the DEP rules require that he do a temp, you know an evaluation of whether sort of some new technology has come along that makes a permanent solution feasible. Frankly, just the way this site is, <laughs> and I say site meaning the 21E site that you know Alan kind of inherited when he bought the property, is really it, it, it may never have a permanent solution. And DEP's rules consider that as long as the property owner performs annual maintenance of whatever is being done for a temporary solution. So while it's not a permanent elimination of risk, there is a temporary elimination of risk for the foreseeable future. And that's just what the property owner now and in the future is going to have to do. But the, the MCP, DEP's rules contemplate that. This just happens to be an extremely unique site, given that it, that whole, all this activity, the cutlery folks filled in the the, the, the raceway with the crap, <laughs> you know, yeah. and and then the fo forest grew, and here we are. So, you know, Allen's kind of was stymied by he was shocked, frankly. I mean, the what he had hoped the cost would be for that other project turned out to be. 50 to 100% less than what it actually, some of the bidding came in at and just was unaffordable. So he's certainly prepared to not only do this, but all the annual stuff that he's been doing. Uh, but that other project just became infeasible. And I'm using the word infeasible because in the MCP, yeah. Yeah. you only do things if feasibility includes both <laughs> technical feasibility, but financial feasibility. Barry, will that a uh, rebuilding of the wall be stronger than the original wall because there may be more powerful floods in our future. Um, well, Lions, you, you're may, not going to grout that? it. You're, you're yes. just putting yeah. stones in place, right? You're not going to nope. do any grouting or anything, right? We're not going to do any grouting. The original wall was built in the 1860s. And <laughs> as far as we know, it has not been repaired since that time. So I would say the original wall was pretty good wall. Um, I would agree that we're probably looking at more substantial storms in our future. Um, and having a wall in place will um, rebuilding this existing wall uh, will make the uh, protection of the bank better going into the future. Better. Um, I do anticipate, yeah. I don't anticipate that we'll be rebuilding the wall anytime soon. Um, I do anticipate that we'll probably be doing um, additional bank stabilization projects um, annually or every couple of years, every five years, whatever, mm. whatever becomes necessary. You know, Paul, it's kind of like we I've have been, been dealing, doing for the last 10 years. I've been de real dealing recently <laughs> in the city of Peabody with stone walls, you know, on scenic roads. And it's funny, it's like you can have a mile and a half of stone wall, you know, that's a hundred years old or more. And there's always, there's some section that collapsed, right? <laughs> and it just may be that there was a round boulder put in and it facilitated the collapse of that section. So when the contractor rebuilds this section, these sections of fallen wall, our, our goal is to have them make sure they place them, you know, structurally with all the right angularity right. to, to so that that portion that happened to fail stands up like the rest of the wall has for 160 <laughs> years right yeah 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 okay so the the access to this uh work area is nowhere near as destructive as the the one that was originally proposed that would have been right. permanent but it, it does include tree removal and clearing of existing vegetation. And I did not see a plan for how that would be restored or what that would look like following the project completion. Lyons, does it require any tree removal to get down to the area or just in the work area? It wasn't much. It was just, it just so. It's one to three trees on that slope getting down. 
Um, and I think it's three to six trees in that 10 foot strip uh, close to the wall. Lions, when you went down there before to do like, you know, the bar matting or whatever, was your access through this same, I'll call it same route? Well, when we do the quar matting, we usually do it from the top. Okay, so would we don't we don't take machinery down on the this will be yeah. the first time we've taken machinery down on the beach. So to Sarah's question, after those few trees, one or three are taken to get the equipment down, is there a revegetation, any kind of seeding or a planting proposed? Um, if there was. Uh, not a problem, right? We just heard you talk to. We, we would we would put seed. Thing. I'm sure Alan could. We would put seed point. on on the steep part where where the erosion controls are um, circular. Uh, we we would fix that. Um, most of the beach is sand and rock, so well, she means we wouldn't up be above. reseeding on, the beach. No, on the road down on the way down. On the on the way down, yes, that can certainly be reseeded with uh, New England logging mix or uh, shade mix or whatever you think best. In the past, we've used New England logging mix. It's not the soil, between the soil and the large amount of shade that's there, um, we don't have much luck getting that to grow, but some of it does. So yeah, sir. <laughs> it's, it's a very challenging location to get things to grow we've tried to get willow stakes to grow uh and it's too dry the, the levee's high and dry and um the willow stakes just don't take even the ones down low don't don't take we've we've tried that well you'd think they would but yeah so that can be restabilized sarah well certainly well, so just to be clear the the trees that we would remove lions small trees right not large mature trees i i'd have to look at what's in the noi yeah uh, it, it most of them are, are the, less the than the six tree inch removal trees i was concerned about but just the overall clearing of vegetation to allow machinery access i would there is there isn't like other location. vegetation there sarah okay I, it said that it, on the plan it was outlined as vegetation removal okay and that means several trees. There really isn't much else growing there. Mm -hmm. we, we can look at it and I'm happy to replant uh, similar to, to, to what's tree? there uh, when we're done. Um, but there really isn't much there. So, so uh, are, are we in agreement that there uh, doesn't need to be improvement? What this is under? Um, well, our our position is because it's a limited project, you know, it's sort of to the maximum extent. Um, you know, the whole purpose of the project is to improve the condition by stabilizing the contaminated soil. So it's right. sort of, that's that's the premise. By it, it's inherently an improvement, um, and the yeah. riverfront will function as it has and does we're not adding impervious surface we're not adding yes uh, i understand that but um uh, whether we're under cmr 1058.5 or or yeah i don't know why mark put that in there it's it's this is not a redevelopment you know you guys may have struggled and i think dep does there every everybody i know struggles with why you know what what is redevelopment we're not taking like an old railroad bed and or or a paved parking lot and eliminating that and reseeding something. We're we're just trying to stabilize the site. Um so I you know I I respectfully disagree with Mark's suggestion like you could go under redevelopment. I mean I think he was looking for a way to maybe find an alternative to the thinking that we didn't meet the performance standard under 1058.4. Yeah, I mean, if the if the commission can find that the entirety of the work proposed, including the area where the wall is proposed to be extended, is indeed a limited project, you can issue an order of conditions, even though all of the per applicable performance standards aren't met. It's not like the Smith application where it, it didn't fit into any of these baskets. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't. It couldn't have complied with the with the new standards. It wasn't a limited project, so it had to be this thing, and you and you had to make that. So, but Mark was suggesting that that was another way to look right. at it. 
Yeah, I, remember, I was thinking as if the order, we're, we're considering order of conditions, order of conditions under what umbrella. So whether we would, would uh, want to see revegetation or not, uh, in addition to the uh, improvement on the wall. To the extent possible. What'd you say, Mason? Maybe to the extent possible. To the extent possible. Yeah, I, I, I pretty Sarah. much accept the premise. I pretty much accept the premise that this, over, as Barry was saying, the overall intention <coughs> is an improvement. Um, that right now, uh, due to the collapse of the wall and the erosion of contaminated soils, contaminated you know, heavy metals and contaminated soils are getting into the stream. Um, this will reduce that, and therefore that represents an improvement. I, uh, right. I don't know that we have right. to do a lot more than that, but, uh, right. but certainly That's the it. commission can do that. Yeah, That's so the I, entire I, intent of the project. Yes, thank, I just wanted to have a sense of what our parameters were that we were considering for the OOC. I understand, yeah. I have a question, Sarah, for you. Um, procedurally, do we need to take a vote to invalidate the previous uh, order of conditions? It, in it order hasn't to been to, uh, Yeah, uh, I mean, it hasn't been requested, so you, you can't take a vote on it at this point. So if an order is issued, I would suggest requiring as a pre-construction condition that that um, invalid order be requested prior to any work occurring. I think what, what the applicant didn't want to get into was a situation where they, they took away their other order and then they didn't get the new order. Yeah, in between. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> I thought very requested it. You know, we would file a formal request for a COC okay. with just a simple letter, but we can get that to you. Yep. I wanted to make it clear we will do that, but we, you, you probably should have a, a formal request so you can do that. Right. Okay. Any other questions, comments from commissioners? Um, it, it was mentioned in the application, but not really specifically detailed about what sort of ongoing work to the slope may be required. And that could potentially be included as an ongoing condition to allow that work to, to occur beyond the life of the order if the commission finds that it's appropriate. Otherwise, you'd need to file a new application, either in NOB be, or an RDA for every- That would be highly year. desirable, Sarah. <laughs> No. So what so what would that work entail? Would it be spreading out of biodegradable yeah. fabric or it, it would, would be, be uh be? straw, straw mat, seed, you know, straw Ryan, mat and Ryan, right now are there any presumably other work's been done on you know like that previously under orders of conditions, right? Yes. And not and outside the order though. So we've no. always done it like as an emergency certification or like an ad hoc thing. Yeah, I was wondering if there are, are there any certificates of compliance on record for work like that already in this area? For the 2005 notice, yes. And, and there was a certificate of compliance yeah. issued for that with a perpetual condition of what? Uh, I don't know that it had a perpetual yeah. condition though. Oh. Okay. Yeah, I don't think that it did, which is no. a concern because every time Lyons wants to do it, he has to. We have to arrange an either an emergency or an RDA. Right. Or so this right. would be the time to do a perpetual right notice, so that if there's you know a fifty foot section of bank that's eroding, we can go and do the repair, and and we're using uh, uh, straw blanket and quar uh, logs and stapling them to the bank. And then seeding it, it, it I, I would. It's pretty uh, simple, but it, it's actually actually, it, it's effective on a, you know, three to ten year scale, and then. I, I would think that could be included as a, an ongoing maintenance plan as as one of the uh, conditions that we would want to see, and we could have Sarah approve that as staff. We don't have to see it before granting the order, uh, but as yes, one please. Of the conditions. Yeah, it's not like we like talking to you every seven years. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Thanks, Mason. It's like cicadas, right? There you uh, go. Uh, or sometimes more frequently. But yeah. uh, now, 
I will say, and um, appreciate your, you know, the questions and the support. Alan made the point to me the other day when we were talking, you know, we never know when it's going to rain, but this is a really good time right now. And he's got a contractor, a local contractor who's familiar with the project and ready to go. So, um, Alan, am I correct in stating that if, you know, if, if you folks would close and approve and get us an order, um, you know, we're, we're, we're hoping to be able to do this this season. Am I correct, Alan? Absolutely. If it's at all feasible, um, if the commission would see fit to vote and issue an order tonight, we're at a historic low point probably in the height of the river because of the drought. And we'd love to be able to get in there in the next couple of weeks to start the work rather than, you know, the, the season could change and it would rain for two weeks straight and then we're in big trouble. All right. So on that note, are there any final questions or comments from commissioners? Well, one more. Um, yep. Lines, you'd mentioned that the amended wildlife habitat evaluation was included in Appendix I, but there was no Appendix I. Hmm. And it, it may be moot because it wouldn't have been required had this project been presented initially. Most likely, the commission could have required it. I'm not sure that they would have, um, but what we did. Be happy to look into that for you. I, I thought we had included one. Uh, I can look into that for you. I don't. I don't have an answer right now. Okay. Yeah, that's, I, that's I thought fine. it was there. So, uh, Sarah, does that affect our ability to to? Vote on this? No, I, the commission typically wouldn't have required it in a situation like this. Um, and I don't know that I would have recommended it separately. It was more just like, oh, it's not here. Did it say that there was all kinds of bad stuff going on? Well, and par partly my interest in having this proceed um, is uh, <laughs> in self defense, that uh, th this has been. Uh, the, the cutlery for the, I don't know, 20 years or so that I've mm -hmm. been on the commission, and Mason, you've been on much longer than I have. Uh, this is a, a perennially thorny, uh, almost impossible to do right kind of uh, undertaking. And so, believe me, I, I know how you feel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I'm sure. Yeah, that, but, uh, uh, you know, I Al and I used to sit around and talk about our joint replacements. <laughs> 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 so if if this is close enough that the commission can uh, approve it, I'd say let's uh, proceed uh, in an expedited way if we can. I agree. Now I don't I don't see any abutters, but I mean I I presume that if you invite public comment. Well, I was going to invite public comment if there are any. Uh, I on my screen I can't see any, but uh, I'm going to invite public comment if members of the public have anything they want to add. I did, by the way, personally place the public notice uh, on Riverside Drive in front of the property. Good to know. Is there a motion to close the hearing since I don't see any public comments? So moved. And a second, second by David. Um, all in favor, Sarah, roll call. All right, roll call, vote on that, Paul. All you still here? He's so, muted. I think he said yes, but okay. uh, David? <laughs> yes. Beth? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Mason? Yes. And Kevin? Right. As you can probably tell from my comments, I'm inclined to uh, give this the go ahead um, uh, with the understanding, as I said, that the whole premise is an improvement so that the extent that uh, this makes a successful argument that this will represent an improvement. I'm I'm satisfied yes. that it does. So, yeah. Count me as a uh, yes, Sarah. <laughs> so um, we have the uh, uh, 
standard conditions and the uh, endangered species and DEP comments. I'm trying to see, Sarah, whether there are any of those that we want to incorporate as conditions. I think we're required to yeah. incorporate the national heritage. Yes, correct. Yeah, DEP didn't suggest any conditions. That I recall. Um, and is there a new fence proposed here? I was just looking at the, the prior no. plan. They give it no fence. Okay. All right. A substantially so, smaller project than. Yes. yes. And yep. so the, the additional uh, uh, condition that uh, we do want to see is a, uh, an ongoing operation and maintenance plan um, that will incorporate the ability uh, to both monitor so you know before a real collapse happens, as things are starting to degrade, you can get in there and fix it before it gets too bad. Uh, so that kind of an operating and maintenance plan uh, approved by Sarah. <laughs> you don't have to come back to the full commission, but uh, that would be one of the conditions we want to add. Understood. Any other conditions from commissioners? Did, did we want to include uh, revegetate? Where practical or where possible? Um, sure. I think that that, as uh, Lyons was saying, that kind of ties in. Area that have too much canopy and too much sand to be have that be practical, but wherever it might be practical, sure, uh, to have uh, native species uh, reintroduce. Any other conditions? If not, uh, uh, make a motion to grant an order of conditions with all of those conditions in it. So moved. So moved. <laughs> yep. Okay, I'll take Paul as the motion and Mason as the second. Um, if no further discussion, all in favor? Roll call, Sarah. Paul? Yes. David? Yes. Beth? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Mason? Yes. And Kevin? Yes. All right, unanimous. All right. If you can't tell, Ellen is jumping for joy right now. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate your responsiveness. Yeah, thank All you right, folks very on. much. Thank I hope you, you for be being a good steward of the property. Yeah, I just want to support it as much as possible. Yeah. Yep. Great. All right. We'll thank you all very much. Follow up with you, Sarah, on anything you need. Like I, I don't know if there's the fee issue. I'll follow up with you on that. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. All right. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so we now have uh, a request for a certificate of compliance on Water Street. This is, this one's going to be really speedy. So this was a a uh, an order that was issued in 1999 uh, for mm -hmm. a we got sewer trench drain extension. Um, <laughs> let's see, let me share my screen. So this is, we, we did actually have the plan set, which is great. And it wasn't a really complicated project, which was nice. Um, so the work subject to the order is this pipe trench to connect to an existing street drain um, for a connection to sewer on Water Street. So the Mill River is down here. Across Water Street, I went and looked at it. It looks like lawn and the edge of a street. So I I presume that it was done according to plans, and this was a long time ago. I didn't see anything that raised any concern or any work that had occurred outside the parameters of the order. Okay. All right. So, uh, any questions of Sarah uh, by commissioners? Sounds like there's no apparent reason not to grant. I wasn't right. quite sure why it was a notice of intent rather than just an RDA, but I guess that's that's neither here nor there. So if it's a certificate of compliance under conditions that we don't have all the details, um, is it just a an up or down vote on our part? 
Yeah. So, I mean, I think we do have all the details. I looked at the order, but there just re there wasn't much to it. It was just a really simple project. So in a single trench from the city sanitary sewer manhole located midway of the westerly bank of the Mill River, it put basically put this pipe in. So it was pretty straightforward. So they weren't building anything new. It wasn't like related to a house that was being built in the riverfront. It was just a straightforward project to do some excavation. No, okay. okay. <laughs> we want to make a motion to grant a certificate of compliance. I'll make that motion. Made by Beth. Is there a second? I'll second for a first. A second. <laughs> All in favor. All right. Paul? Yes. David? Yes. Beth? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Mason? Yes. And Kevin? Yes. All right. And um, then we'll go to any other business before we bounce to executive session because we will not be returning to. I see. Okay. After that. So any other business, anybody? Okay, so not for me. Do so. Uh, we need a motion to go yeah, into so executive session. A motion session. to enter executive session for uh, the purposes stated on the agenda, with the intent not to return to open session. So hmm. moved. by David. Second. I'll second. Second by Beth. Roll call. All in favor. Paul? Yes. David. Yes, you said uh, yes. Beth? Yes. yes. Melissa. Yes. Mason? Yes. And Kevin? Yes. 